Greetings, everyone, to the inaugural formal debate hosted by the Science Circle. We have two esteemed volunteer debaters to argue a topic of general interest and societal importance today. I am your moderator, Stephen Gager, Zoot Fly in Second Life. And before we begin, I want to go over some ground rules and issues. The greater aim of these debates is to demonstrate rational and reasoned parlay as much as it is to inform the audience on a relevant topic. Debate volunteers are charged with the task of creating rational arguments supported by good data to develop a case for or against a proposition. To be clear, they do not necessarily have a personal stake in the side they take, nor do they have a necessary investment personally. In fact, they may be arguing against their personal beliefs for the sake of today's event. So please take no offense and avoid the generation of disdain against them for the arguments that they make. Today's format is a shortened version of Oxford Union style debates, which borrows from Lincoln Douglas debates, which I will summarize in voice while posted in local chat. We will have uh, opening arguments by each side of 10 minutes each, then a pause. This pause is an opportunity for the audience to ask questions and get clarifications. Please, I am those to me in advance of that pause. And then there will be re time for rebuttals, summaries and final arguments, and then a final uh, thank you close. During the debate, we ask that local and voice chat be quieted while the debaters are expressing themselves. The debaters are to ignore local chat during arguments. If you have a point of order or desire to ask a question for the pause, please I am me. At my discretion, for the sake of the debate and audience, I may address them or ask the debaters to address them. Disruptors to today, uh, sorry. Disruptors to today's event will be immediately banned and ejected after a warning that is unheeded. Now, on to today's proposition. The chamber proposes the US should adopt a more regulated free speech regimen akin to the United Kingdom or Germany for misinformation or destructive topics. A moderator's note on the definition of free speech. In today's context, the US does not have a completely unrestricted free speech regulatory schema. It refers to ideas directed to the government and are not protections for directly harmful speech, like yelling fire in a crowded theater. And of course, we do have a set of libel and fraud laws that pertain to harmful speech against individuals or groups, which are considered unlawful. Now, in contrast to many nations, in particular the EU members, we do have higher burdens of proof for harm, especially against the press, and case law favors the side engaged in the speech. In addition, there is no federal scheme to address what is merely misinformation, whether intentional or not, or harmful or not, in the U.S. In this context, please understand this context of the proposition. And now I welcome the two debaters to take their places. And the uh, speaker for the proposition, that would be Gus, will provide an opening statement and welcome, and then begin his argument. Thank you all for joining today. My bad, my bad, sorry. Let me go back. Tagline is speaking for the proposition, and Gus is speaking for the opposition. Thank you, sorry for the mistake. Yeah, no, I just looked to my right and that's uh, confused. So go ahead, go ahead and take it away, Tagline. Hello, so uh, as I understand, this is where I introduce myself. And yeah, short introduction and for the opposition. And for the uh, audience and um, Gus and uh, Stephen, uh, my esteemed colleagues here, uh, I would like to share um, a list of references that I used in uh, preparing for this. Uh, so that's gone out just now, just for your uh, value. Um, uh, I have been involved in um, uh, Science Circle for um, 
about seven years probably, and uh, I would describe myself as an old man who was um, born of old parents who were born of old parents. My grandfather was born in 1865 and the other in 1874. Uh, my ancestors have been in the United States since, um, every one of them, since before it was uh, made a country separate from uh, 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 Great Britain. Um, I had ancestors die in the Revolutionary War. I had... Uh, ancestors in the Civil War, uh, and one who was from Tennessee who fought for the Union, and in Shiloh, in fact, as a Union soldier, ended up getting killed on his doorstep, um, bleed and bled out into the tulip wood planks uh, in West Tennessee. And when the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, came up to the farm, called him out, and shot him to death. It was a domestic terrorist group. And uh, I've uh, been initially a mathematician in uh, the heart of me and uh, decided to go to medical school for a need to be of service and use to the world, as I felt. Uh, and I did that as a career and spent about 40 years in medicine. And um, I'm retired spent all my time studying languages, five languages really, outside of English, and um, mathematics, and I try to keep uh, abreast of the world uh, with global interests. Uh, I am honored to be invited here to speak uh, and uh, take part in this first debate. I think it's quite an interesting new development for Science Circle, and uh, I welcome my esteemed colleague Gus, and um, I appreciate your hard work in uh, organizing and moderating this, Stephen. Thank you. I don't have uh, much of an intro, but I want to welcome you all here. Uh, welcome my debate opponent, Tagno, and thank you, Stephen, for putting together all this. Uh, what's my background? I worked as a NASA contractor after getting my engineering degree. I've been part of three tech startup companies. Uh, I've been interested in free speech, politics, and foreign policy since I was in late elementary school. Um, today, I will rise in opposition to the proposition that the U.S. should not adopt a um, that. The, I'm sorry, that the U.S. should not adopt a uh, regulated free speech regime. Sorry, that's my statement, not opposition. Thank you. Can you hear me? I think my microphone is on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open with a number of uh, examples of concerns that show there are some serious problems with unmoderated free speech. And um, I would say it's beyond the purview of this debate to present solutions. I don't intend to try to do that, although I have a few I could suggest and um, prepare to speak about those a bit, uh, maybe in the closing. Um, first of all, uh, uh, in the realm of abuse of free speech that's between individuals or directed at an individual. This includes defamatory and hate speech. Defamatory speech is a false statement that harms someone's reputation. It has to be a false statement. It must be communicated to a third party for it to be defamatory. And something muttered under the breath doesn't count. And it has to be harmful to the subject's rep reputation and the person suing or bringing the case um, who presumably has standing uh, must show that and that they can show that the statement or statements were about them. Um, there's a, a lot that's not included defamation. Opinion 
in my opinion, somebody's a jerk, that's not going to be defamation. And uh, that's uh, kind of a safe way to guard yourself in social media if you're under the attack. Uh, a statement that's uh, true is not defamation, or a statement that cannot be shown to be true or false would be uh, uh, um, a case that would be thrown out. There's also insignificant error, like if you uh, got someone's name wrong, misspelled it, or something of that sort. Uh, in the United States, defamatory speech is rarely, uh, re relatively rarely taken to court. Perhaps 5% of defamation cases reach trial due to early dismissals and the difficulty of proving defamation. It's a high bar to prove. Um, there are First Amendment uh, protections and actual malice has to be demonstrated, and that makes it very difficult. You have to somehow convince uh, that you have a, a handle on what was in the mind of the individual um, perpetrating the defamation. Uh, so early dismissal is a consequence of many of these uh, um, uh, cases. On average, uh, they take about one year to reach a verdict, but they can take several years. Um, I have an example of one recently. I'm going to jump to it, um, in which uh, a, um, a public figure uh, 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 put out information and uh, at some point uh, revealed that it was not true uh, openly. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the former Mayor Giuliani, who was ordered to pay $148 million to Georgia federal election workers he had defamed. Uh, that may seem like a sweet deal for these ladies. Uh, but uh, he ruined their life, and an important point is it took three years, three years for this to be dealt with by the legal system. The legal system is uh, fraught with delay and manipulation and um, loopholes, and the, the um, uh, one of the uh, victims, uh, uh, Mrs. Moss, said, I was afraid for my life. I literally felt that someone would attempt to hang me, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. If you're a black person in Georgia and you feel like somebody might try to hang you, that's saying something, given the history of the United States. And um, it's something a lot of people these days are out of touch with. But uh, that's an important aspect. There's true harm done. These people were afraid to come out of their house, afraid to go anywhere, afraid of being attacked in public. And they got uh, threats all the time, uh, unintended. There also um, are issues of cyberbullying, which could be argued to be free speech. Uh, and uh, people could say, go, why don't you go kill yourself? Uh, and it leads to suicide. Uh, and in children uh, ages 15 to 19, suicide is the second leading cause of death. In children 14 to 15 years ago, it's the number one cause of, le of, of death, according to the CDC. It happens online. It's been on a rise in this age range in particular, especially since COVID-19 and the increased use of the internet. Um, it's very difficult to get justice if you lose a child to bullying. Um, again, for guys, the legal system is so slow. It's it's a it's a retroactive sort of thing in a sense, but it can't fix the past. Um, suicide is also a concern among college students and. Uh, of them, uh, about uh, almost 13% report having suicidal ideation 
uh, almost 6% uh, having a plan for suicide. And over the past year, about 1.29% of college students have attempted suicide. 30.5% reported emotional abuse, which I think would include uh, 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 verbal abuse uh, for sure. Uh, uh, and in contrast, about one-fifth of that, 6.25% reported physical abuse. Some had both. Um, I also would point out hate speech. We think often, now oh, that's against the law. Well, international law protects free speech, and hate speech is uh, generally protected under the, it's, it's considered protected uh, speech under U.S. law. Uh, when it, cases go uh, before a court, um, the um, freedom uh, to say whatever you want is generally uh, upheld and, uh, and uh, supported. If a crime uh, emerges from uh, uh, a, an incident where, uh, or an incident where uh, there's hate speech, that's a hate crime, but that basically requires face-to-face for it to be uh, fighting words, which is another legal term, that uh, fighting words are not considered uh, um, free speech. Uh, so there are some restrictions there. Uh, uh, fighting words are words which, by their very utterance, inflict, thank you, inflict injury or incite an immediate breach of the peace, but it's a face-to-face -face situation. There's also abuse of speech as disinformation. Uh, one uh, which I'm going to be very brief on is uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, reached out to uh, authorities in Samoa uh, in um, around April of 19, uh, 2019 and uh, took his anti-vaccination uh, crusade there and uh, it's a very Christian and somewhat uh, holistic uh, society, and uh, so they became afraid to get the vaccine. He suggested that the vaccine was causing a few deaths rather than measles itself. Then in October of uh, uh, 2019, uh, an outbreak of measles occurred where in this island uh, nation of 200,000, we're they had about a third or less immunized because of people turning away from the uh, uh, vaccination. And uh, in part by uh, his efforts as a rich, famous individual who'd come uh, impressing them uh, with his attention, and 83 children died. 180, uh, 1,867 hospitalizations, mostly babies and young children, uh, uh, were uh, uh, consequent, and thousands more fell sick. Uh, this illustrates disinformation can kill. Um, to go on, um, uh, abusive free speech can occur, and this is very serious, by malign intent on foreign powers intending to harm the country. For instance, 2016, Cambridge Analytica, working with Facebook and uh, a... Uh, that is time. Fraudulent, Finish your argument. Fraudulent use of data. Uh, uh, weaponized information to uh, um, vulnerable, targeted recipients to manipulate the elections. And there's been manipulation that I can document in uh, 2020 and in uh, 2024. Um, and um, that is an existential issue for democracy. I'll stop at that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tagline. And now, making the case for the opposition is Gus. Ten minutes. Thank you, Tagline. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of Science Circle. Today I rise in strong opposition to the proposition that the U.S. should adopt a more regulated free speech regimen akin to the systems in the U.K. or Germany. I'm sorry, but can you all hear me okay? I'm hearing you fine. Spiffy, thanks. Uh, while these 
These models from these two nations may appear to provide a solution to misinformation and harmful speech. The risk they pose to democracy, individual freedoms, and the foundational princi principles of this nation outweigh their potential benefits. The First Amendment is not merely a law. It is a profound trust in the ability of individuals to discern truth from falsehood, to debate ideas openly and to challenge authority when necessary. It embodies the belief that censorship, whether by the state or by private ent entities under the state's mandate, inevitably leads to the suppression of progress. Questioning and critical thinking are vital to resisting authoritarianism. Both are vital to positive change. Let's not forget that the suffragettes, the civil rights leaders, and countless others whose ideas were once considered harmful or misinformation changed the world precisely because they could speak freely. Would they have thrived under the vague and subjective definitions of misinformation or harmful speech? I think not. Let us uh, look to practical challenges. Who decides what is harmful or false? In Germany, the Netz DG law has led to the overblocking of legitimate discourse, silencing minority voices in an effort to comply with strict regulations. In the UK, vague terms like malicious communications have stifled pr freedom, even leading to prosecutions over social media posts that, while controversial, were far from criminal. Such systems create chilling effects where fear of penalties prevents citizens from speaking their minds. Imagine a world where artists feel uh, fear creating provocative work, where academics shy away from bold research, and innovators stifle groundbreaking ideas. This is not progress, it's regression. And how might such a censorship regime be implemented? Given the vast quantity of speech, automatic systems such as human language technology tools would be required. But current, currently, human, uh, HLT tools are not advanced enough to handle the complex, uh, complex task of judging hate speech on their own. They struggle with nuances such as context, sarcasm, and rapidly evolving language, leading to frequent false positives and sometimes false negatives. Cultural differences and bias in, biases in training data further complicate such tools' effectiveness, often resulting in disproportionate impacts on certain groups or the failure to detect subtle forms of hate speech. The risks to democracy are profound. Alexis de Tocqueville once warned that even societies that uphold free speech legally can fall victim to de facto suppression through social or political pressure. If we give governments or corporations the power to define acceptable speech, we hand them the tools to silence dissent. Harry Truman once said, once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of the opposition, it has only one way to go, and that, that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures. History is rife with examples of well-intentioned speech controls becoming tools of tyranny. Further, regulated speech laws can er erode public trust. When citizens perceive that information is being filtered or controlled by the state, they become more susceptible to conspiracy theories and distrust of institutions. Suppression breeds suspicion, not enlightenment. Instead of fostering an informed popula uh, populace, censorship can amplify the very misinformation it seeks to suppress. And there are better solutions. Equip our citizens with media literacy tools to discern, discern fact from fiction. Encourage counter speech. Truth and reason can dismantle lies far more effectively than censorship ever will. Strengthen critical thinking in schools. Build community-driven 
initiatives to combat misinformation without stifling the freedom to speak. And let's trust our legal system to address direct harms like defamation, incitement, and fraud, as it already does. When the limits of permissible speech are unknown or nebulous, many will not risk going anywhere near the edge. Far fewer would seek truth and innovation. Tight control of speech will mean many are fearful to show curiosity or to even seek not some forms of knowledge. To adopt a system akin to the UK or Germany would be to abandon the bold experiment of trusting the people with freedom. It would mean trading our foundational principles for the illusion of safety. As Orwell reminds us, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, the cost of regulated speech is far too high. Let us preserve the freedom that defines us, even as we tackle the challenges of misinformation and harm. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Gus. A well-reasoned argument on both sides with fine examples. Uh, are there, we will pause here to address any questions from the audience in terms of needs of clarification or in the argument. I have not received anything by M so far, so. Okay, I have a raised hand from Mondlicht. Go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Um, fire in a crowded theater is, uh, is a, as I understand it, a restable speech. It can lead to direct harm. Um, and it's a long used example, I think dating back at least to the 1950s. And that's, that sort of harm is already protected, I'm sorry, is already punished within U.S. law. Yes, and I will jump in because I offered the opening uh, monologue on that, that fire is not necessarily a contextual idea, right? Ideas in terms of criticism as what we do not wish to regulate, whereas fire is a directive and in basically a creation of a harmful situation. It's not an expression of, say, point of view. Uh, next question, actually, uh, let's see, uh, Gus, could you address Ho, 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 Mondlik's question in local chat. And then Dolly, I think we'll have to, I am me, we'll go on from there. But go ahead to addressing the question. I will provide them uh, toward the end of, of this uh, session. I I don't have those readily at hand on any of my open screens right now. Fair enough. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Prue. We will have to belay that answer. All right. Let's go ahead and begin with the next phase. What we will have is an eight minute argument coming back from the proposition, which will focus more on rebutting the arguments uh, that have been made already in the case, or again, bolstering stuff they've already said. I would. Uh like to state um, at the top here that no one suggests uh, reasonably that you can live a life without having the risk of feeling insulted, slighted, uh, ridiculed, uh, have your feelings hurt, feeling alienated, uh, ostracized, or whatever. Uh, that's going to happen. That's part of life. Uh, is a lot of degree in this, uh, but uh, uh, there has been um, uh, 
censorship at times in the history of the United States, and uh, also modification of uh, of uh, uh, communications. Uh, one I would point out as an example in 1949. Um, if I can think of this, um, it, uh, the Mayflower. Uh, um, um, doctrine emerged uh, as a result of uh, three uh, major television networks controlling the message, and uh, uh, it was a um, precursor of the fairness doctrine, wherein uh, 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 um, the uh, uh, organizations that had the um, uh, privilege of having the ear and the attention and the communication ra uh, channels to the American people would give uh, air to uh, uh, diverse views and also give qualified uh, speakers uh, uh, the chance to respond. And um, uh, in 1968, in I guess um, uh, it seems to me it was my March of 1968. Uh, LBJ, uh, 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 Lyndon B. Johnson, was president, had asked, "Why are we having riots in black neighborhoods in cities across the United States? Must be some reason." One of the things that happens when people don't have a voice is they get angry and get mad, and they. Uh, get violent, uh, and that's part of human nature, and uh, that that we carry with us generation to generation. Um, he commissioned what was uh, concluded in what was called the Kerner Report, which condemned uh, um, uh, discrimination, basically, and uh, said that America was moving toward a black and white society, that the media did not have a voice of black people and their issues, nor did they have employees working for them that would help bring a voice from that demographic. And so that was a push toward um, bringing the media into a more egalitarian uh, distribution of speakers and presentations. Uh, it didn't go far enough, in my opinion, but uh, it, uh, it it showed how the United States government, for instance, can uh, work to modulate uh, free speech. Uh, and uh, interestingly, there have been um, uh, right-wing or conservative uh, uh, voices, like from the Cato Institute, that argued that the fairness doctrine uh, uh, was uh, against conservative viewpoints, but uh, that seems to me comes down to the free speech for me and uh, crickets for thee. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have free speech controlled by uh, one group, then uh, you'll s slide on into authoritarianism. I think we're in response to this argument about uh, damage to democracy. The United States is on the slippery slope right now, and it's not too far to the edge where there's a sheer drop off of democracy and uh, uh, individual rights. Individuals deserve the rights they have, but they are bricks. And bricks become walls and become buildings and uh, a part of a bigger thing. And uh, we have to think of uh, the whole to some degree. We can't think just of the individual, uh, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, uh, I would also point out Yuri uh, Bezminov, uh, an ex-KGB agent in 1980s, uh, uh, had defected, and he revealed a long-term uh, systematic strategy by the Kremlin and intelligence services of Russia, of the USSR at that time, to, of demoralization of countries that they considered uh, vulnerable or 
in opposition to their needs, to the Russian uh, government's needs. And demoralization uh, involved uh, disinformation, uh, confusing people, getting people to believe that nothing was true, and and um, getting people to distrust their health system, their government, their uh, elected leaders, and uh, um, eventually, uh, uh, through a number of steps, I would, it's too Two much minutes. to talk about, uh, incur a breakdown of that society. And uh, one last point I would make. In, uh, you know, the first school shooting in the United States occurred November 19th of, of 1840 by um, a student at, with a mask on at um, uh, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And uh, the students were rioting. Students in the early 19th century rioted uh, when they got upset about the food or any other thing. It was quite common, actually. And um, so in this case, the students liked bringing guns and shooting them in the air. And they had been, uh, they'd made rules against it on the university campus, against them having their guns and shooting them. And so a bunch of those uh, students uh, uh, had tar barrels and set them on fire and they were shooting their pistols. And one uh, described as a beloved law professor, everybody liked him, he went out to see what all this hullabaloo was about. And one student uh, 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 from behind a pillar jumped out and uh, started to run away from him. And he had a mask on, so he wouldn't be recognized. But then he turned and shot the professor in the stomach. And he died yet, uh, three days later, which to me suggests uh, peritonitis and a sepsis and a horrible death. And uh, he was never caught. Actually, he was caught in a, in a pine grove and um, given bail and went on the lam. And seven years later at his brother's house in Georgia, shot himself in the face and committed uh, uh, suicide. But uh, my point in all this is that times have changed. Uh, we had little problem with school shootings and... Uh, now anybody in the United States can get access to a, uh, an automatic weapon and be able to kill uh, great numbers of people in seconds. Um, and um, similarly, uh, the uh, information has been potentially weaponized with advanced weapons via the Internet that weren't available to people in the 18th century. And I'll, uh, I'll I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Tagline. And now we have eight minutes for rebuttal and bolstering arguments from the opposition. Gus, take it away. I do want to confirm y'all can still hear me, given the the chomps by the cat on the wireless headphone. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> cool. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, while the concerns about unmoderated free speech raised in this discussion so far are concerning, the arguments presented fail to address critical counterpoints and nuances. Free speech, even when seemingly unrestrained, is not the problem in itself, but a reflection of larger societal dynamics. Look, let's uh, di dissect the arguments presented and offer alternative perspectives. First, my esteemed opponent raises the issue of abuse of free speech, focusing on defamatory and hate speech. It emphasizes the harm caused by defamatory statements and the challenges of addressing such cases in the U U.S. justice system. However, the high standard for providing defamation, uh, I'm sorry, for approving defamation, I should have gotten more than three hours of sleep, sorry guys, uh, exists for a reason to protect against frivolous lawsuits and ensure that an individuals can express their opinions without undue fear of retribution. The difficulty of prosecuting defamation 
reflects the importance of safeguarding robust public discourse. Restricting speech too broadly to prevent potential defamation could have a chilling effect on legitimate criticism and free expression. For example, what constitutes harm to reputation can often be subjective and influenced by cultural or political context. The ambiguity highlights the risk of gr granting broad authority to regulate speech as it could easily be weaponized against dissenting voices or political opponents. The solution that lies not in reducing the threshold for defamation cases, but in educating individuals on media literacy and critical thinking. And this will empower society to discern facts from falsehood more effectively. The second major point involves cyberbullying and links to suicide. While this undoubtedly is a critical issue, inflating it with unmoderated free speech oversimplifies a complex problem. Cyberbullying reflects broader society and societal and psychological challenges, such as lack of empathy and insufficient mental health support, rather than a failure of free speech itself. Technological advancements in content moderation and reporting mechanisms can address cyberbullying without broadly curtailing free expression. On hate speech, my esteemed opponent acknowledges that such speech is protected under the U.S. Constitution, but argues that most developed uh, democracies have laws restricting it. While this is true, these restrictions often come at the cost of eroding fundamental freedoms. For instance, in countries with hate speech laws, dissenting opinions on contentious issues are sometimes suppressed under the guise of combating hate. The U.S. approach, while imperfect, emphasizes safeguarding the marketplace of ideas. Offensive or hateful speech is best countered by more speech, by presenting better, more inclusive arguments, not by silencing opposing views. The examples provided, such as the abuse women face on platforms like Twitter, underscore a failure of corporate governance rather than a failure of the principle of free speech. But the abuse is not all from other users. There are cases of women losing their Twitter accounts merely for asking if the tw COVID vaccine is safe while pregnant. Platforms can and should implement stronger moderation policies while respecting the spirit of open dialogue. It is possible to address harassment and abuse without imposing sweeping restrictions that stifle legitimate discourse. Turning to the section on disinformation, the case of Samoa's measles outbreak is deeply tragic. However, attributing the crisis solely to the misuse of free speech is misleading. The roots of the tragedy include systemic issues like weak health care infrastructure, a fractured public trust, and a delayed response by authorities. This information exploited these vulnerabilities at worst, but did not create them. Solutions should focus on strengthening public health systems and improving science communication rather than curtailing speech. Blanket restrictions on controversial opinions, even when misguided, risk setting a dangerous precedent for government overreach. My esteemed opponent also discusses malign intent by foreign actors, such as Russian interference in U.S. elections. These activities are criminal, not because they involve free speech, but because they constitute fraud, identity theft, and unauthorized access to information. Accessing these threats requires targeted legal and cybersecurity measures, not limitations on speech. Two minutes. Conflating speech with actions like hacking undermines the core distinction between expression and criminal behavior. Additionally, while the harm caused by misinformation propaganda is undeniable, the responsibility lies in fostering a more informed and resilient citizenry. 
When individuals are equipped with proper critical thinking skills and access to diverse per perspectives, the influence of malicious actors diminishes greatly. Free speech, paradoxically, is one of the best tools for exposing and countering disinformation. Open dialogue allows misinform I'm sorry, misleading narratives to be scrutinized and debunked in real time. In closing, my opponent's concerns about the consequences of unmoderated free speech highlight real societal issues, but the proposed implications threaten to undermine the very freedoms that, uh, that enable progress and account accountability. The solution is not to restrict speech broadly, but to focus on the root causes of the harm, inadequate education, systemic vulnerabilities, and the failures of corporate responsibility. By addressing these issues, we can protect individuals and uphold the principles of free expression that are foundational to any free society. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gus. And now we have our final closing arguments. In this case, the opposition goes first to make the closing argument. And so I will give two minutes to Gus, and then Tagline will have two minutes in response for final closing arguments. When you're ready. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand firmly against the proposition that the U.S. should adopt a regulated free speech system similar to those of the U.K. or Germany. The First Amendment is not just a legal protection. It is a bold testament and tool in people's ability to discern truth from falsehood. It assures that progress is born from free debate, not from government-mandated silence. History shows us that movements like civil rights and women's suffrage succeeded because free speech was protected, even when their ideas were, were deemed controversial or harmful at the time. Regulated systems like Germany's Netz DG law have resulted in overblocking and censorship of legitimate discourse, silencing major um, I'm sorry, minority voices in their effort to comply with overly broad definitions of harm. These laws create chilling effects, where fear of penalties stifles creativity, innovation, and dialogue. Worse, they hand governments to silence tools to silence dissent, slippery slope to authoritarianism. Instead of censorship, we should combat misinformation with critical thinking, education, and media literacy. The solution to bad speech is more speech. Truth and trust grow in open debate, not in suppression of that debate. As Oscar Wilde said, I may not agree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to make an ass of yourself. Let us honor that principle and preserve the freedom that defines American democracy. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And tagline. Is the microphone on? Hearing you fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of quick points. One is that hacking alone isn't uh, related so much to free speech, but taking the information and relieving it, uh, releasing it uh, in pieces uh, in a targeted way with uh, disinformation entered into it, that is harmful, and that is uh, related to abuse of the fr of free speech, free expression. Um, the um, point I was making before, and I, I went to talking about how uh, if you consider that the U.S. Constitution was written by the hand of God, then you can't uh, challenge any aspect of it uh, and um, uh, originalism makes sense, but it was written by men, uh, older and 
uh, middle-aged men uh, of, with land, and uh, many of them with slaves, um, all of them white. Uh, and uh, uh, it is not imperfect. In mathematics, we don't use the same mathematics uh, symbolism uh, to a large extent or techniques that were used in the 18th century. We use some of them, but uh, we didn't stop there. And uh, the, the uh, system has to be uh, tolerable of change and progress and adaptable. The example in 1949 of a modification of free speech uh, by uh, the Mayflower Doctrine uh, leading to the uh, Fairness Doctrine is an example of government interceding and uh, as was the current report. That is time. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, may I say one your, last word? Yeah, yeah, finish your. The, uh, in my opinion, for the United States, um, this argument may be too late. I think that free speech has been abused and uh, uh, taken advantage of uh, by countries that uh, won't tolerate it. And very soon, the United States itself could lose free speech. Um, and it, there's already uh, quakes of it with uh, threats to newscasters and uh, individuals that uh, someone wants to have retribution against. Uh, and the news uh, outlets are closing up a little bit and uh, trying to protect themselves and sucking up. Uh, and uh, we may be beyond the point of no return already. Uh, and this was accomplished largely by uh, manipulation of uh, weaponized disinformation. and. Uh, uh, it's existential, and when an authoritarian government gets voted into power, that has a high chance of being the last time you'll have a choice, and they will not tolerate free speech. So uh, there needs to be a happy medium at some point, and I'll stop with that. Uh, there needs to be a place in the middle, not extreme, simplistic, Occam's razor type application to social affairs and human law, because that doesn't work. It's more gray uh, uh, scale than that. But uh, otherwise, you die. And uh, you don't exist further as a democracy at some point. And that, now, I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you for letting me finish that. Sure, thank you. And I think, uh, again, it highlights the fact that we have a tricky issue to discuss that comes from what is democracy, at, democracy can be at stake or people and their well-being can be at, well, at stake. Tagline, as the last part of today's, that this thus ends the formal arguments back and forth. I do want to give Tagline the opportunity to make a uh, uh, final comments on today's event. Thank you. Uh, it was an honor to be invited to uh, participate in this. And um, um, I, it, it was a challenge for me to, uh, I tend to uh, uh, think through things the way hillbillies play songs, uh, never the same way twice. Uh, that's one of the problems in recording studios with uh, hillbilly music. and. Uh, they tried to do tracks. Uh, I do have a, a quick comment about uh, 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 ways of dealing with this uh, uh, other than, uh, uh, you know, pressing laws on individuals. I think that the corporations should be uh, responsible for what they put in their windows for passerbys. Uh, and, uh, uh, they um, uh, should not be taking rubles without asking where they're coming from. Uh, when speaking of uh, Facebook, really, I think uh, return to the fairness doctrine or something like it that would fit with 2024 would be a, a, a good consideration that 
regards the um, uh, uh, reach of uh, uh, to the public as a privilege, and uh, if uh, one institution or organization presents something uh, of one viewpoint in something that has uh, a controversy that opposing viewpoints have to be uh, presented uh, in the same medium. Uh, this could help counter the tendency for niche programming uh, to a bubble audience that hears only one thing to validate all their little biases. Um, that's a huge problem, I think, for the United States right now. Uh, and why people are not speaking the same language, even though they sound like they're saying th things in English. But uh, the the dealing with any changes would require negotiation and uh, uh, collective thought of a uh, uh, an appropriate group of people, um, legislators or. Uh, if it can't happen, uh, then maybe a new revolution and a new constitution needs to be created. It may take that to uh, create a country that protects the rights of its people uh, and doesn't allow itself to be abused by uh, 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 infringement on those rights and abuse of those rights by foreign powers that want to see us collapse. And that's my concluding statement. Thank you. And thanks to the audience for hearing all that. And uh, it's been an honor again. I know. Thank you, Tagline. And just for sake of uh, completeness, uh, Gus wanted to make a couple quick comments at the end as well. I feel honored to have uh, participated. I really uh, enjoyed the, the prep and the delivery, um, and I hope you all got something out of it uh, or, or maybe even enjoyed it. Thanks much. Thank you. And we will thus conclude today's debate. We are not having any formal uh, voting or uh, what we might consider a winner. I hope everyone felt informed and were able to observe a reasonable, uh, well-articulated debate for each side. Uh, so.